NED, and I'll be uh, this panel's moderator. Uh, before we start, uh, Mr. Harry Wu would like to have two minutes. I'm sorry that uh, at the beginning I, we missed the photo. I want to show you that uh, what the Yu Zhejiang, Yu Dongye, and Lu Dechen they did at the Tiananmen Square movement. They did. They're using the portrait, using the paints in the X, destroy the more portrait. This is the first time during the 60 years, Chairman Ma portrait was damaged. You'd have to move down. And Chinese authority have to cover up and exchange the photo. This is during the 60 years, the first time the Ma portrait was stopped at the Tiananmen Gate. We do not know when it was done, but I totally believe sooner or later, more poetry will withdraw from the Tiananmen Gate. They did it once. They will appear in the future again. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to follow up on uh, on the first panel with another uh, distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, special thanks to um, all of our panelists, uh, some of whom had to fly in from out of town. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your uh, coming to speak and uh, for you to, to you for attending the conference. Um, so the speaking order will be uh, uh, Xu Wenli, uh, David uh, Yu, Yu Dahai, David Yu, uh, Louisa Congreva, Dan Blumenthal, and then Bill Schultz. And I'll just, uh, quick uh, introduction, I encourage you to look at their bios, their careers speak for themselves. Um, so uh, Mr. Xu spent 16 years in prison for his activities as a dissident. Um, he played a major role in establishing the Beijing Tianjin branch of the China Democracy Party. And he's now a fellow at the Watson Institute at Brown. Uh, Mr. Yu Mr. Yu co-founded the Chinese Economist Society um, and uh, has been affiliated with Beijing Spring and its predecessor, China Spring, since 1989. These are uh, dissident publications that NED has been proud uh, to, to, to whom to serve as a funder. Uh, Luisa Griva, she's program director for East Asia at NED here. Uh, she has testified before Congress on Human Rights in China several times, and she was a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, Mr. Dan Blumenthal is a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, previously, he served as senior director for China in the Secretary of Defense's Office of International Security. Uh, and finally, um, Mr. Bill Schultz, uh, he's senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. And uh, prior to that, he served as executive director at, at, at Amnesty um, from 1994 to 2006. And most recently, he's been uh, laying out uh, uh, recommendations for the Obama administration in all areas of human rights policy. So. Um, and uh, before we begin, um, as you know, the th today's theme is um, from Tiananmen Square to Charter 08, the potential for political reform movement in China today. And uh, just as a quick book, book plug, we have a book called Charter 08 and China's Transformation published uh, hot off the press by Lao Gai. So uh, anyone who's interested in a copy, please approach us later. And so now um, let's begin. Uh, Mr. Xu, please. Good morning. 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 Good 
如果翻译上有问题，责任在我，不在他。She had she didn't talk to me that much about what I'm going to talk about today. So if the translation is not perfect, is my responsibility, not hers. 今天看见了天安门的三位勇士。Today I saw the three heroes of Tianmen. 既高兴，心里头也有一些酸楚。I'm very happy, but I feel I'm very saddened too. 特别看见于东岳被中共的政权折磨成这个样子。Especially when I saw Yu Dongyue as being being tortured by Chinese government to this state. 所以我在此向他们致敬。Therefore, I want to show to give my respect to all of them. 向北京当时的那些学生们致敬。I want to give my respect to all the students at the Tiananmen Square in 1989. 向付出了许多的牺牲的北京的市民，但是他们却默默无闻，向他们致敬。I want to give my respect to all the citizens, all the all the citizens in Beijing, and for their sacrifice. In uh, that day. And all those uh, mothers of Tiananmen massacre, I want to show my respect for them. Jonathan younger people. 所以的话呢，我简单的对我自己有一点点小小的介绍。I want to thank uh, Jonathan's introduction to uh, to me. I mean, for me, and but for younger generation of Americans, I want to give uh, my introduction, uh, brief introduction now. 我知道刚才主持人已经做了介绍。I know uh, the moderator already gave some introduction earlier. 我从七八年从事民主运动，第一次被他们判了十五年徒刑。Since 1978, I engaged in the China's democracy movement. They gave me, they sentenced me to 15 years prison terms. 后来在一九九三年，中国想取得最后一个待遇，如果有最后一个待遇是百分之八以下的关税，如果不是是百分之四十以上，所以。克林顿政府在否决两会议案的时候，要中国释放，啊，所以这样子的机会，我做了十三年的牢。But because in 1993, because the negotiation of negotiation of MFN MFN status, so because of that, China will gain much better benefit. So I was released earlier. I only spent 13 years in the prison. 第二次是因为江泽民听说在APEC会议上，普京总统邀请了啊这个俄罗斯的总统，呃，布什总统邀请了普京总统来他的家乡，这个德克萨斯巴比Q，所以他需要这样子的一种荣誉，所以他啊作
um, I'm not, we are not in the position, or I'm not in the position to criticize uh, anyone to see who's right, who's wrong, but because after the massacre, all this brutal events, and we, we just hope we can learn something from it. Number one, first, we have to organize against the brutal government. I originally I'm not I don't believe in party government, but uh because to again to to uh go because we have to work against this government, we have to really systematically organize our effort. So Therefore, in 1998, um, after I got sentenced, I feel that I really have to have this uh, China Democracy Party organized. 从来没有被镇压掉的这样子的一个政党，啊，没有被他们扑灭掉。Now I have to tell everyone, the China Democracy Party is the only party, only opposition party, which is hasn't been completely demolished by Chinese government. 它是在中国发生的二十八个省市，啊，共同举办的这样子的一次创党活动。现在他们的领导人经过坐牢，他们又出来了。他们正像刚才鲁德成说的，我们活下来了。There are eight twenty-eight provinces in China. They have uh, China Democracy Party's members, and we all our members they've been imprisoned by Chinese government, and they all come out. Most of them come out, and they are still working. On the party's event. Another thing is very important is we have to have a very uh, have some kind of guideline for the organized movement, and uh, Charter 08 is the thing is the thing we are looking for. 昨天我有机会从你们的国会走到了林肯。纪念堂，还是林肯说的那几句话，说的完全正确，就是民有、民治、民享。Yesterday I had the privilege to walk from the Congress to the Lincoln Memorial, and whatever Lincoln said was so true. It's for the people, by the people, of the people. 昨天晚上十一点，我再次的向林肯总统保证。中国也一定会走向这样子的一个自由民主的国家。Last night at 11 o'clock, I guarantee to President Lincoln, I said China will be a free country. 因为有美国朋友像NED这样子的支持,我们一定能够做到,谢谢大家。Because we have the support of American people, like People from NED, all these organizations, we can achieve our goal. Yeah. I think there's still morning, so uh, good morning. Um, following uh, Xu Wenli, I want to uh, just uh, introduce myself a little bit. Uh, Luisa already mentioned I published a magazine called Beijing Spring in uh, New York. Uh, but in fact, I have been in this country uh, for uh, longer than I have lived in China. I came to uh, study at University of Pennsylvania back in 1982, before some of you were even born, I suppose. Um, uh, so I've lived uh, in this uh, 
uh, Meiguo, beautiful country, for 27 years. Um, but still, um, I love China. I love America, too. Uh, and it, it saddens me that I have not been able to come back to China for 20 years. But I hope um, that day uh, will come uh, soon. Uh, what I want to talk today about is a uh, sort of a general assessment of the monumental events uh, in 1989. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the seeds of uh, those uh, uh, events were really sown uh, long before, uh, during the 27-year uh, rule of the Chinese Communist Party between um, 1949 and 1976. Uh, you know, uh, Mao Zedong's uh, uh, arbitrary and brutal rule caused the death of uh, tens of millions of Chinese, and even the Communist Party itself admitted that um, the Chinese economy was brought to um, the brink of a collapse uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I agree uh, very much with, with Harry Wu that uh, the portrait of uh, the Chairman, uh, uh, Chairman Mao should be removed from uh, uh, Tiananmen. I want to remind Harry, though, that we still have the dead body of uh, Mao Zedong in Tiananmen Square as well. That too should be removed. Uh, but by 1976, um, I think the discontent in the Chinese population was so severe that uh, the, the CCP rule was in serious danger of being toppled. And at that juncture, uh, Deng Xiaoping initiated uh, the policies of reform and opening to the outside world and the uh, resulting uh, recovery and progress of the Chinese economy sort of um, uh, reduced uh, the tension in the, in the society and uh, 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 made the people uh, you know, uh, more, more, a little bit more content. But the problem with that policy is that by op opening to the outside world, uh, the, uh, Deng also gave the Chinese a chance to see uh, how much damage Mao's rule has caused, had caused to China. You know, back in 1949, the economic conditions in China were not that much different from, say, that of Japan or Hong Kong or Taiwan. But by 1976, um, the per capita income in China was only a tiny fraction of, of, those, of, the, of those other uh, uh, economies. And so this opening policy in, in one way also in reinforced that discontent. Now, um, by the, the mid-1980s, even the reform itself ran uh, into a great deal of trouble. And the basic reason there was, of course, um, as you know, the Marxist, the socialist, the Maoist ideology. Uh, the, re the reform faction uh, within the Communist Party, led by uh, General Secretary Zhao Ziyang, wanted to have a market economy instead of this uh, uh, command uh, planned economy and wanted to allow a uh, private enterprise. But that uh, program reform ran counter to the uh, uh, official ideology of socialism. And in terms of uh, uh, political reform, that was even uh, uh, more difficult to achieve. So. What uh, Zhao Ziyang wanted to do was to try to implement some reforms piecemeal. For example, he wanted to um, allow some prices to stay controlled while uh, having others uh, relaxed. The problem with that was that uh, it uh, gave the officials an opportunity to uh, exploit the price differentials, and that's really the beginning of the uh, corruption in China of the recent, uh, recent uh, decades and also caused a great deal of uh, inflation. So by the, by the um, uh, late 1980s, uh, you can say China was once again fell into this winter of discontent. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, 1989 uh, demonstrations um, occurred. Um, once, once the demonstration started, a uh, lot of people had hopes about uh, you know, uh, political and economic reforms in China. But the interplay between the government and the uh, movement turned out to uh, uh, be very quickly degenerating into a, a, a vicious 
cycle. Uh, as you know, there were quite a few student demonstra demonstrations in the 1980s. None of them were brutally uh, put down by the army, or uh, very, uh, in fact, very few uh, uh, leaders were even arrested. That gave the students of 1989 a false sense of safety, and that also helped them. Uh, you know, it, it was it was useful in uh, you know making the movement as big as it, it became. Uh, it swelled its ranks and all that, but it, but the, that swelling of the, uh, the, uh, the ranks of the demonstrators also uh, frightened the government uh, to no end, and so the government repeatedly uh, issued uh, a very uh, severe threat against the students. Uh, but instead of being coward, the, uh, the students just became angered and uh, you know demanded uh, more and more from the government, and the uh, of course also the Beijing residents. Uh, took part in the demonstrations uh, as well. So in a sense, both the, uh, the sense of safety and the sense of, uh, uh, both the sense of safety on the part of the dem demonstrators and the sense of fear on the part of the government were illusional. And also the, the students, because of their they saw so much support, had the sense that they had uh, near universal um, uh, support in the Chinese uh, population. That also was illusional. Uh, just like, uh, uh, you know, in all those French revolutions, Paris was always so much more radical than the rest of France, so too Beijing in 1989 was not China. It, it was not representative uh, of China. So uh, in that situation, uh, the government uh, finally decided it had to crack down. And uh, Deng Xiaoping himself, of course, approved the uh, imposition of martial law. Uh, but I think he agreed to this somewhat reluctantly because it does mean, uh, did mean a repudiation of some of his own uh, sayings and his own policies. Uh, so in this regard, I sort of disagree with uh, some of the uh, uh, activists who thought this was all a big, uh, you know, uh, a well-masterminded plan being, uh, you know, un, un unfolded. Uh, at my, my feeling is that he did this rather uh, reluctantly. Um, even the imposition of martial law didn't, need, didn't necessarily imply a massacre like what happened in 19, in, in, on June the 4th, 1989. And I think that uh, the leader of the conservative faction, uh, Li Peng, uh, really uh, got rather hysterical, especially when the uh, when the army who tried to enter uh, Beijing was halted by, you know, uh, begging and and uh, and crying uh, residents, uh, he thought this is a you know uh, we have to do we have to occupy Beijing at all costs and that of course uh, caused uh, the uh, massacre. Um, uh, the exact uh, uh, train of events of 1989, in fact, is still not very clear. And that is because, as the previous uh, panel uh, mentioned, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, still tries very hard to hide what happened. It doesn't want people to talk about it. It doesn't, doesn't talk about it itself uh, because it knows it's, it's, it's a shameful epi episode uh, of its uh, history. Now, the uh, massacre, of course, revealed that the uh, regime was really uh, the true nature of the regime, that is none other than a military uh, dictatorship. Am I talking too long? Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, oh, three minutes, three minutes is enough. <laughs> um, so um, after uh, the massacre, I think in a way the government continued to be frightened and uh, sort of maintained mar uh, martial law really all across China. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, adopted some really dramatic measures of uh, control. For example, it, it uh, demanded that the all college students go uh, spend time in an army camp, that sort of thing. And the key phrase uh, then was to prevent what is known as a, a peaceful evolution, that which is a, which is a strategy forwarded by, uh, of all people, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, John Foster uh, Dallas. That, that is all, all the way back in 19... Um, 53. Um, but if that policy continued, we could probably expect China to look somewhat like North Korea or Cuba today. Um, 
you know, the, there was no more economic reform and uh, really um, the whole society was sliding backward. It was again, thanks to Deng Xiaoping, that uh, China sort of re restarted its reform. Uh, Deng, uh, in 1992, uh, made a speech, or made several speeches, but the key uh, uh, thing that he said is no more discussion of whether something is a socialist or capitalistic. Uh, the unmistakable message in that speech was uh, in order to survive, in order to uh, keep the, the regime going, it's okay to adopt the uh, capitalistic road. If he said anything like this, you know, before 1989, he would have been, you know, roundly abused within the party. But um, uh, after 1989, the survival of the party rule was at stake, and uh, apparently the party decided that uh, that was uh, okay. And uh, as a result, you know, we saw this, uh, um, these uh, e economic development and uh, the whole uh, rise of China uh, in the past, uh, like, let's say, seven, 17 years. And so in a way, we can say that uh, the 1989 democracy movement actually promoted progress in China in that it helped China get rid of that straight jacket known as socialism. So uh, we, uh, but of course, the market economy China has now is uh, defective and deformed. Uh, it, uh, it's a sort of like the, what the Chinese communists uh, say, call the bureaucratic capitalism of the pre-1949 uh, China. And uh, it's our belief that the cure of the ills caused by this, uh, you know, uh, deformed system lies in the unaccomplished goal of 1989, which is democratic reform. And it is our hope that uh, the reform process can commence um, soon. Thank you very much. My topic today is China's political culture since 1989. Certainly after the Tiananmen massacre, the go government faced uh, terrible questions. Uh, what allowed this to happen? And how do we, now that we've made our decision how to deal with it by crushing the movement, how can we repair the damage that we know we've done in our relationship with the population? If the people were upset enough with the situation in China, with the government, with the party, uh, upset enough to come out and disrupt protest on the streets and quit classes for over two months to stop traffic on the streets of Beijing and hundreds of other cities for uh, almost a month in some places. Uh, they hated the government enough then. Uh, won't, they, won't people hate the government more now that they know the government has uh, killed people in cold blood uh, with battlefield weapons? So, of course, the answer was, of course, enforce silence on the crimes of, of the party and, of course, secondly, uh, fill the space with an alternative story. So now it's uh, a, almost a cliché to say that the legitimacy of the government, its uh, claim to a good relationship with the people rests on the twin pillars of nationalism, love the country, love the party, uh, and consumerism. So I want to concentrate on the nationalism uh, part of that equation. Um, and it's very timely, you know, uh, watching the news, you've seen that the government has uh, again announced last month a new patriotic education campaign to mark the uh, 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. So we'll see uh, these themes coming up again and again uh, in the media over the next months until the October 1st uh, celebration. Um, I would just wanted to mention four dimensions to the patriotic education campaign, um, military training, uh, national essence education, guo qing jiao yi, thinking about history, and finally the ethnic dimension that's been briefly raised. Um, of course, it was the military that fired on the people. Uh, certainly, uh, its it, reputation was damaged, and so there was an immediate response to try to repair that reputation, and a whole uh, you know, Love the Army campaign went down through the educational system, uh, focusing mostly on young people. Yu Mao Chun was describing that last week at AEI. Um, and indeed, the military training was imposed uh, on students. In fact, if you had been accepted into university uh, 
in the spring of 89 intending to enter in the fall, you didn't get to go to university at all. The, you know, the government had decided that it was simply too dangerous to let students gather. Um, they all young people then knew what was going on. The high school students had joined with the college students, and so they didn't get to go to college that year. They spent the entire year in military training first, military discipline. But uh, that gradually uh, faded, and so a much more lasting effect of the decision um, in 89 to conduct patriotic education was really this guoqing jiaoyu, sort of educating people anew what the national essence was. Um, a really good phrase for it um, is that it, it can be called the I am Chinese campaign. So the government set out to teach people anew what it meant to be Chinese. We're not to copy Western models. We're not to peacefully evolve into something other than uh, what we, uh, the leaders, can tell you. So all the ministries, the State Education Commission, the Ministry of Culture, the Central Propaganda Department, the Communist Youth League, the Ministry uh, of Education, uh, all got together and created a series of new curricula, guidelines issued from the central government and so on, from kindergarten through university, get them while they're young. Um, and one extreme example of where this goes now, again, 20 years later, after the original decision was made that we have to beef up our patriotic edu education is a, a fairly popular uh, YouTube video posted just about a year ago, uh, popular I think because it's shocking, it's a unnamed primary school, children singing long list of uh, lyrics about uh, their, their country and then the final uh, cheerful chorus says, and let us step ruthlessly over all anti-China forces. So that's, you know, uh, sums up the spirit of it. Of course, this uh, carries through to understanding China's own history, um, the history uh, through the textbooks, through the museums. Um, people, I'm sure, have been uh, looking, you know, noting the reports of uh, the kinds of exhibits that are being rolled out, um, reinforcing actually a more socialist than uh, independent view of history, um, China's modern history, enforcing the victimization of China, the national humiliation of China's weakness in the face of the colonial powers at the time of the Opium War in the 1840s. Um, just a couple of quotes for you. Uh, the story of China's modern history is the history of the courageous, agonizing struggle by generation upon generation of the good-hearted masses for national survival. The history of an extremely weak, impoverished, and old China gradually growing thanks to the socialist revolution into a prosperous country and so on. Um, uh, the, this history of China's uh, revival then has an international dimension with looking at China's uh, uh, humiliation at the hands of foreigners who did attack China when it was weak, the uh, English and of course Japan. Um, there's also here, then I want to get to the strong ethnic dimension. Um, you know, when you talk about national unity and you talk about teaching people what it means to say, I am Chinese, relearning what it means to be Chinese, uh, it certainly means you have to stand for the unity of the motherland. We will not allow uh, dissenters to disrupt uh, as they did in Tiananmen Square, but that clearly uh, means reinforcing uh, a feeling that uh, Taiwanese separatists are to be uh, utterly despised and crushed. The Tibetans, naturally, are uh, ungrateful. Um, in fact, the term patriotic education itself has a special meaning for Tibetans. It, 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 when implemented in Tibet, and wave after wave of patriotic education campaigns have been conducted in Tibet over 20 years, uh, it specifically means denouncing the Dalai Lama, the splittists, uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing, and so on. And finally, for the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and East Turkestan, uh, there's another twist on it which has to do with, um, it comes in the form of national unity education and now a new campaign just announced by the Ministry of Education just four, five months ago in December, the Ministry of Education said, uh, we need to have more ethnic harmony education. So we will have uh, regular courses in throughout Chinese primary and middle schools um, with a regular course requirement, 10 to 12 school hours of ethnic harmony courses every year. You know, it sounds Orwellian, Orwellian, it really is. So to illustrate something about this view of history and what it means for, um, you know, the, the enforcement of a rather uh, strict and, and narrow view of <coughs> how p Chinese people can analyze their own history and, and how they 
uh, have improved uh, where they haven't. I want to go back to a story when I was in China in the mid 80s. Uh, I was a student, so 22 years ago uh, in Nanjing, uh, classmates would point out to me which history books were worth reading. And they said, you open the front, uh, they open, open the book, and you'll notice the first page and a half uh, exactly says this, the point that I just read to you, which was a contemporary description of a, actually a museum exhibit. Um, all the books have the, uh, give you the Marxist periodization of Chinese modern history. The feudalism, and then you have modern history, which is starting with the Opium War, and the half-colonial, half-feudal society, right? That phrase that everyone of Yu Dahai's generation can re recite, ban zhi min, ban feng jian, shi hui. Uh, and then after that nightmare, you get to the contemporary history of China, which is post-1949 um, communist rule and the beginning of a of, of good time in China's history. Um, so my classmates in the 80s said, yes, that'll be there, but all you have to do is start looking about halfway down page three when Almost mid-sentence, this breaks off, and if the person is a real historian and has done some research, wants to illuminate something interesting, has gone into the archives, uh, you'll find that just is abandoned and the real st history starts. Uh, so at that time, this is only now less than 10 years out of the Cultural Revolution, uh, you had to recite, anyone writing a book had to recite the standard party line, uh, but you could, it was just a, a front and you, they all basically said the censors are too stupid to look past the first three pages. <laughs> <laughs> and I think now um, maybe we're in a little bit of a worse situation because we have a much more thoroughgoing uh, penetration of this idea about China's standing in the world, what it means to say I am Chinese, um, that it's, the censors don't have to stop after three pages because they've got search engine at, uh, help. Um, they can read the entire thing with a computer, um, and you will be censored if the fourth and fifth pages of the book try to look at something a little more independently and look at a real question of history. Um, so as uh, one of the professors who gathered in Beijing a few weeks ago to commemorate the 20th anniversary said very movingly on her blog, you know, why do we need to talk about June 4th? Um, she was looking back actually 10 years before when she'd asked herself this question and, and asked, um, We've, we've enforced ourselves a silence and uh, only using the government line for 10 years. In this situation, how can we prove that the words we write convey truth and real meaning? Uh, we're living with uh, silence on the truth and in fact uh, actively participating in the lies. I think we all stand with her when we say we have to break out of that, let, let our conscience speak. And I do believe that um, suppose we did have uh, a promise, uh, some kind of reform movement that would allow us to have internet freedom in China, academic freedom, press freedom. As all the journalists that have been spoken of showed, it only took a few days for people to uh, start reporting in a completely new way, very eye-opening, uh, to see on the screen a true story of what was happening, not relying only on BBC and VOA to know what was happening in China. But I think in some sense that would really only mean the work, the hard work had just begun. after. 20 years of a strongly enforced uh, ideological line on history coming after all on the basis of a previous 40 years of a communist party that thought it could mold people into a new man and enforced its own idea of, uh, had censorship all along. Um, the corrosive effects of this kind of uh, teaching including uh, what a previous speaker, speaker referred to about the illusion of freedom, that you have much more colorful propaganda now. It looks like more freedom. There is consumer choice, and so people may have a more of an illusion of freedom than they might have, perhaps, when it was quite clear that you had a Maoist uh, uniformity. So these habits of self-censorship, or maybe there's don't need to have self-censorship if you're actually ignorant, uh, but there is another side of the story. The cynicism that's engendered all of that will become uh, subject for some real hard work in building a new political culture in China. Thank you. I too would like to thank, um, thank NED and the Lao Guy Foundation and um, all of uh, all the people who participated and ha continue to participate in reform efforts in, in uh, 
China for for hosting this event and, and for being here today. It's quite humbling to to be around um, such such brave and heroic um, people. I, I would note that that the Lagai Foundation and NED is uh, one of the only institutions in, in Washington um, that is actually doing something to commemorate the Tiananmen uh, massacre. And that in itself, I'll get to later, but speaks to uh, a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today, which is the geopolitical and general political climate for political reform in China. Um, I think it's noteworthy that that uh, there's a lot of silence on on the issue. I, I think it could be attributed to a lot of different things, but what are think tanks and research institutes for if not uh, if not to raise controversial issues and and debate things that aren't that aren't going to be debated uh, inside our government necessarily. So to the question of the geopolitical climate for reform in in uh, China, uh, uh, the short answer is is it's bad. And I could sit down and uh, and after that, but instead I'll make 22 points to uh, to in 12 minutes to uh, to back to back that up. Um, let me first quote a little bit from from Jonathan Mursky's article uh, that he wrote recently about what the CCP must have learned since 1989, and that is that um, as Mr. Mursky pointed out, Dung was right to expect. Uh, very little condemnation uh, from from the West. Uh, within months, uh, President uh, George Bush, the elder, sent his national security advisor, Brent Scrocroft, to China, uh, toasted uh, Deng, and, uh, and was overheard saying, according to Mr. Mursky, at least, I wasn't there, uh, <clears throat> my president wants you to know that he is your friend forever. And this was just a few months after uh, this was just a few months after the massacre occurred. Um, not long after that, uh, John Major uh, basically asked for U.S. Uh, permission or, or the go-ahead to, to meet with the Chinese authorities to discuss Hong Kong, and uh, there, there was no problem with that either. More recently, as Mr. Mursky has pointed out, uh, the, uh, the former mayor of London, Ken Living Livingstone, compared the massacre to some riots that occur now and again in London, uh, back at home. Not to pick on the British too much, because back at home the situation isn't that much uh, that much greater. Secretary Clinton's first visit to China uh, made a point of downplaying human rights issues. Um, this was actually celebrated by American and Western scholars of China and foreign policy, as if the downplaying of human rights is this great achievement and maturity that we've that we've we've moved to, and, and thank God now we can get on to more important things than, than discussing human rights. Uh, not to pick on any one party, the Bush administration, uh, their approach to reform in China was um, they're on the right track, and we're going to convince, through private diplomacy, we're going to convince Hu Jintao that it's in his interest to democratize, as if Hu Jintao didn't know what his interests were which was not to democratize, um, because that would mean a loss of power. Uh, and even Speaker Pelosi recently, on her trip, downplayed uh, human rights. She's always been a stalwart of human rights in China. And uh, uh, she, I guess, is what we say in Washington, maturing in office, which is a euphemism for uh, not wanting to bring up unpleasant things anymore once you've been in office for too long and get to higher positions of responsibility. Uh, I, I don't disagree that in environmental protection is important, but I, I think without the basic rights to protect yourself against uh, polluters or government pollution, uh, uh, and environmental protection isn't uh, going to mean much. I'd also say the climate has changed quite a bit in the sense that, uh, that uh, when I was working at the Department of Defense a few years ago, uh, the European Union was this close to lifting the arms embargo placed on uh, China for the Tiananmen massacre, and uh, uh, and no longer spoke of it as a, a human rights issue. Had 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 really um, co-opted the language of the CCP in saying that, well, look, China is um, has developed so much socially, 
and so much uh, economically that that we really need to talk about human rights in broader f in broader forms than just uh, individual rights and so forth. So it, it was a near run thing, and it, it could well it could well happen again uh, in terms of lifting the embargo. Um, so, but this is a real shame that the geopolitical climate is is so bad for reform in China because, as we all know that there are many, many brave people still working for reform in China. And sometimes it amazes me what they do and, and, and what they uh, are able to, what they risk and what they get away with, the kinds of things they teach their students in some cases, the kinds of cases they take on, and so forth. Um, I think the, I think the uh, applause uh, by, some, um, by some scholars here in, in, in Washington and, and throughout the country of, of the downgrading of human rights is, is, is very much indicative of the general problem in U.S.-China relations, which is that when we talk about China, we talk about or relations with China, we talk about the relations with the communist government. We don't talk about all the people, the 1.3 billion people, many of whom very much want change and want more justice and want more openness. And, and so <laughs> when, when, one says, when one says, well, it's a good thing that we can move on uh, from human rights because that's what the Chine Chinese want anyway, that's, they're, they're, they're really talking about uh, the nine or so members of the Politburo who want that, not, not the Chinese people themselves. Um, <coughs> and you know, one thing that's striking for any visitor in China right now is the Chinese are back to lecturing each of us on their quote unquote core interests. And it's a sign of both confidence and insecurity, which is the, the dangerous mix, I think, that characterizes the Chinese government today. By core interests, they say back off on, on Tibet and the Dalai Lama, back off on Taiwan, which one would think they'd be more relaxed about today, back off on the Uyghurs and, and a few other, and back off on human rights in general. And we are, uh, we're doing so. Why are we listening so much? Well. It's always for some hoped for gain in geopolitics. So uh, we're going to back off on unpleasant issues uh, because we're going to gain Chinese uh, support on suppressing issues like North Korea or Iran. Well, of course, that's not true. We're not going to uh, gain Chinese support for North Korea uh, or our policies on North Korea or Iran, whether you're President Bush or President Obama. Uh, so you're, you're sacrificing. You're sacrificing many of your principles for these hoped for gains. Uh, you can recalculate things, I suppose, if, if you actually got, uh, obtained some of these um, gains from China, but, but we're, we're certainly not, in my opinion, doing so. Um, China has, has managed very successfully to conflate its own domestic concerns with, with other people's geopolitical concerns. I think foreign policy in China is very much local. Um, leave us alone, and we will help you with such and such. Is is the message, and we leave. We, uh, uh, w w you know, it's it's like the old saying about the Soviet Union, where workers showed up and they they said we pretend to work and they pretend to uh, to pay us. In in, in relations with China, uh, it's a little bit different. We do leave them alone, but they don't actually help us uh, uh, with with what we ask for. Um, so they've gotten much, much better at the game and conditioned, uh, we've conditioned them to ex expect successes. Uh, and I would say that geopolitically, as they grow stronger, of course, uh, our leverage decreases with, with uh, human rights issues. Today, they don't want to get into a confrontation with us about just about anything because they need uh, the U.S. market and, and although they make all, all kinds of murmurings about U.S. debt holdings and so forth, they, they need to place those reserve holdings somewhere. Uh, and, and, and they also want the respect and the prestige that the quote unquote West or the democratic nations can bestow upon them. So they're, they're, we still do have that leverage. I'm not sure how much longer we will. I think in terms of our strategic interests, this approach we have with China is, is to our great detriment. It's not only because of the moral uh, vacuity of of ignoring human rights and political reforms in such a big and important country, but we have, a, I think, a primary and vital interest in China's democratization. I cannot see how this great transformation in world politics that is happening because of China's rise ends well 
if China doesn't engender the trust of the other great powers. And let's face it, the, the great powers are not going to trust China uh, so long as it still acts this way towards its reformers, uh, you know, um, has a uh, uh, calls uh, calls the Tiananmen a kind of criminal kind of revolutionary movement, um, and I'll just give you one small example. I was in Nanjing recently and saw the um, you know the, the memorial to the massacre, uh, and of course it's, it's a tragic memorial, uh, the uh, Japanese massacre. But it's a little bit hard for for people who who take human rights seriously to to really. Uh, pay homage to those who died in, in Nanjing if the Chinese themselves are are not taking account of, of people they slaughtered themselves. And, and so, ch again, China's acceptance in the 21st century into the, the world community, I think, is very much contingent upon its, its uh, becoming a more open and just society that can, that can deal, with its, deal with its history more forthrightly. Um, <coughs> you know, so I think that we've fallen – in, in U.S. foreign policy and, and, and discussion, and I guess scholarly discussions as well, of the China reform movement into, I'd say, two or two and a half schools of thought. One is the just wait school, and you know this is kind of a, a bad social science theory gone awry and become policy, which is modernization theory. You know, as soon as the Chinese uh, get uh, to seven thousand dollars of GDP or whatever it is, the next day they'll be a democracy. Uh, I guess based on the Taiwan and South Korea example, but of course people forget how much how much we pushed uh, the Taiwanese and South Koreans in that direction and the and the leaders they had uh, that helped them be become d democratic. Uh, and then there's kind of the democracy is not right for China school, which is coming back. Uh, believe it or not, this was I guess uh, the son of uh, or the bastard s stepchild of the Asian value school, and and it's it's making a comeback. And, and so I think what we have here is social si science theory gone awry combined with uh, what Freudians would call co sophisticated rationalizations for why we don't do the things we're supposed to do. And you put those two together and you get the recipe for the geopolitical climate we have for, refor for reform. The third school, which I think many people in this room would be in favor of, is, is take on the issue uh, much more directly. And, and I, I think that I read recently uh, somebody celebrating, the China scholar celebrating Speaker Pelosi's uh, desire to downgrade, or not desire, but actually action to downgrade human rights uh, publicly as a great maturing and a great understanding of China and how much the Chinese government will say face by these actions and so forth. But I think that's exactly wrong. Uh, I think that uh, the, the more publicly uh, people with great human rights records speak up about human rights, the more sucker provides to reformers in China. Uh, so I yes, uh, if, we, if we had a more direct approach on these issues, things would be more confrontational with China for a time. Uh, but, um, but again, they still need us a lot more than we need them. That may change in 10, 15 years. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to cost us too much uh, to, to bring these issues up more publicly. Um, I would note, I, I would end with a final note of why it's in our strategic interest that China uh, democratize, and that is that if you look, if you if you look throughout revolutions, whether they were the East, Eastern European revolutions alluded to in 1989, or the French Re Revolution that somebody uh, noted before, or the American Revolution, if you don't have the seeds of, of lib liberalism and democracy and civil society deeply in place, then a revolution can go uh, can go very badly. It could, it could make things a lot worse than than. Uh, and and I'm one who does not think that the CCP can go on in its current configuration as it is. At some point, they'll make mistakes, they'll split on some issue, and one better hope that uh, the seeds of liberalism in China are, are stronger than the seeds of of, of something far worse, and, and those, who, uh, those who take power uh, are, are sort of uh, guided by, by a society that's, that's ready to rule itself. So on that note, I'll stop. Thank you.
<clears throat> Good morning. Like uh, Dan, I have been asked to speak not so much about what is happening inside China as to what the U.S. can do about it. And I certainly agree with Dan's remarks. It may surprise you that someone from the Center for American Progress and someone from the American Enterprise Institute agree <laughs> on anything, but I, I certainly ag agree that to the extent to which we can discern a current U.S. human rights policy towards China, it is little more than to placate the Chinese government. And certainly the headline in the uh, New York Times this morning, uh, which indicated that Geithner softens tone in approach to Beijing, while focused largely on economic and currency issues, reflects that placating approach. I'm reminded of a speech that I gave some years ago at a university, after which a woman came up to me and she said, Dr. Schulz, I couldn't hear a thing you said. You spoke so softly. And thinking to be modest, I said, well, you're probably not missing much. And she said, I know, that's what everybody told me. <laughs> Indeed, sometimes when one speaks so softly, what one says is not worth hearing. <laughs> Dan referred to Secretary Clinton's remarks on her first trip to China in which she said that America's pressing China on human rights issues can't interfere with the global economic crisis, the global climate change crisis, and the security crisis. Well, on one level, Secretary Clinton was simply stating the facts. The truth is that the reason that human rights have largely been superseded by other bilateral interests, not just by this administration, but certainly by the Bush administration as well, is simply because in large measure, as the Chinese uh, finance minister told Jamie Fallows in the Atlantic a few months ago, you should be nice to your banker, especially when you owe your banker hundreds of billions of dollars. Even if the U.S. makes no progress in influencing China on human rights and democracy, the truth is that we will continue to need to negotiate with China around issues such as those Mrs. Clinton identified. And on one level, those too are human rights issues because if the world economy continues to deteriorate, millions of people around the world, especially the poorest, will suffer devastating infringements of their right to an adequate standard of living. If we don't solve the climate crisis, we can't solve it without China. Millions of people will sacrifice their right to life. And if great superpowers like China and the United States fail to find common ground on international security issues, the world could indeed witness suffering on an unimaginable scale. So these two are indeed, whether Secretary Clinton knows it or we understand it as such, these issues are also human rights issues. The problem is, and what Secretary Clinton didn't say, was that you're unlikely to make much progress on those social and economic and security issues without greater respect within China for civil and political rights as well. The other comment the Secretary made that was roundly criticized by those in the human rights community was her observation that, quote, we pretty much, we pretty much know what the Chinese are going to say on human rights, religious freedom, and Tibet. But that, too, is simply a statement of fact. It is a reflection of the failed, formulaic, traditional U.S. approach to China. The U.S. has long seen itself, of course, as championing human rights in China, reporting regularly on abuses in the State Department's annual human rights report, for example, and raising concerns privately about individual prisoners. But U.S. policy towards China has generally vacillated between either harsh condemnation, as reflected in dozens of congressional resolutions that have been introduced, and some of them passed over the last 25 years, condemning China, or on the other hand, flimsy acquiescence prompted by the faith that economic growth alone can be counted upon to effect improvements eventually. Whether or not it was a wise decision of the Clinton administration to de-link trade from human rights. The fact is that ever since then, human rights policy towards China, U.S. policy, has simply lost its moorings. And what is certainly true is that the U.S. government has rarely spoken 
with one voice about the matter. Moreover, the U.S.'s clumsiness in our human rights policy towards China has been exacerbated by the decline in the U.S.'s own credibility on human rights over the last eight years, thanks to our own myriad violations committed in the name of the war on terror, and more recently due to the economic crisis itself, which has diminished the reputation of this country as the leading proponent of free market-led democratic reforms. So one of the things that we need to do is to convince policymakers that improvement in human rights in China is good for the United States, not just for feel-good reasons, not just for moral and ethical reasons, important as those of us in this room think those are, but for hard, pragmatic reasons of re realpolitik as well. Because states, for example, that allow themselves to be held to account by their own citizens and respect the rule of law tend to be more reliable partners in their coalitions with other states. Any authoritarian country is inherently brittle, caught up in the needless preoccupation with controlling its own population, and that makes for suspicion and resentment of outsiders. That's not good for the United States. The absence of a viable opposition within China or fully independent press makes a ruling party less wary of abrogating its international agreements or alienating other nations for no good reason. That's not good for the United States. A fickle approach to the rule of law jeopardizes everything from business contacts for American corporations to enforcement of trade and commercial agreements. That's not good for the U.S. government or U.S. business. Cheap Chinese labor undercuts American jobs. And the higher the labor standards in a country, the slower the U.S. trade deficit generally grows. Moreover, finally, if we accept the commonly agreed proposition that democracies rarely, if ever, launch wars against other democracies, then a more democratic China is likely to be a less belligerent China, at least in the long run. So what should the United States do? The key is to take a coherent, pragmatic, and yes, non-ideological approach that resists reveling in easy rhetorical attacks that have no oomph, no power behind them. Now, certainly it is true that the U.S. would be traducing its own values if it failed to call China on account for its human rights violations. We must, for example, continue to stand with the Tibetans. We must continue to raise the cases of hundreds of thousands of political prisoners imprisoned without fair trial. But the problem is that there are very limited ways in which the United States can punish China that do not do damage to its own self-interest. And no government is going to take action against another if the consequences are problematic for its own interests. What we need to do then is to convince China that its own self-interests are implicated in greater respect for human rights. We need to connect the dots for China between appearance and reality. We know, for example, that every year hundreds of labor demonstrations and riots take place over issues like corruption and land use and environmental concerns or police misconduct. Criticism may appear to be destabilizing, but prevailing, providing vehicles for critical expression actually can have the very opposite effect. Uh, effect. Having experienced more than our own share of bad press over the past eight years, the U.S. is now in a far stronger position to impress upon China the importance of playing by internationally accepted human rights norms. But the U.S. cannot do that by itself. So another principle that we need to follow is to globalize the pressure on China. The decision, for example, by the African dock workers to block arms shipments to Zimbabwe was invaluable a number of months ago, not only substantively because it sent the message that it was not just the usual suspects in the West who were purveying concern about China. The UN Committee Against Torture's recent critical report on abuses in the Chinese legal system, coming as it did from a respected international body, made it impossible for China to deny the global nature 
of human rights criticism. And finally, now that the U.S. is a part of the U.N. Human Rights Council, we can help use that council and its universal periodic review process to focus on Chinese abuses. Finally, let me say a few specific things about what we ought to do concretely. First of all, it may sound bureaucratic, but we have not as a government spoken with a coherent voice. So the government, the president, should create an interagency working group on human rights in China to coordinate and prioritize policies from state, from defense, from labor, from commerce, from the environmental field. Secondly, we should continue our U.S.-China dialogue on human rights that was long suspended by the Bush administration, but we should establish benchmarks for success and coordinate our conversation with our European allies who also are engaged in such dialogue. The U.S. should reverse the decline in government funding for human rights and democracy programs in China and should encourage non-governmental funders, foundations for example, to meet together to develop a coordinated funding strategy themselves. We should review and update the export control list to ensure that the U.S. is not supplying law enforcement with equipment designed to abuse people's rights. The Congress should review the information and communication technologies voluntary global network initiative and make sure that it is in fact working and if it isn't and there is good reason to think it isn't or may not then indeed take remedial legislative action. We should either strengthen enforcement of the 1992 Memorandum of Understanding prohibiting trade in labor products made in Chinese prisons, a memorandum that has been honored largely in the breach, or we should consider scrapping it. We should keep proposals on the table and keep pressing for a diplomatic office in Tibet and a special envoy for Uyghur affairs, and we should stress at the highest level of our own government to the Chinese that they must cooperate in ending crimes against humanity in Darfur. So just as important as any of these specific commitments are, what is most important, I would say, is to stay the course. The truth is that China's attitude toward political and civil rights will not, short of a revolution, uh, come quickly. Indeed, the current economic crisis may mean that progress will be even slower. But China really is, as President Obama said, on the wrong side of history. And our obligation is to keep pressing, to keep reminding China and the United States of that fact and of the truth of Martin Luther King's observation that though the arc of the universe is long, it does eventually bend toward justice. Uh, so now it's 12.15, and, and uh, until 12.45, we're going to have Q&A. Uh, quick reminder, please identify yourself and what group you're with, if any. And uh, we'll try to be brief and uh, as a sign of consideration to others, since there will be many questions. Uh, Voice of America, Alex Shung, uh, senior editor. I have a question for... Louisa, Dan, and then Williams about uh, the topic of today. How do you think the potential of political change in China? We did have a chance to answer that, but perhaps we didn't answer it for a good reason. Um, uh, I believe there are many contradictory trends and forces in China today. If anything, China is a place full of contradictions. And uh, I would say um, my approach is to look, hopefully, that is look with hope on all those people who are trying to make a positive difference. And so when we look at the people who are seeking justice, the owners of property, the uh, individuals who are standing up for their labor rights, uh, people standing up for victims of crime, for their civil and political rights, their property rights, and then those who are helping them, the journalists, the lawyers, the medical professionals, and others who are, want to uphold a higher standard of how institutions should work 
in a just society, people who are living uh, as if it were a self-governing society and people took responsibility for upholding ethical standards in their work. They aren't changing the political structure of China, but they're trying to establish new norms within their own sphere, and I have to hope that that will make a difference in the long run. I think, uh, I think political change will happen in China. Um, I just simply don't <coughs> uh, buy a lot of these linear theories that what happens yesterday will happen tomorrow. Um, I, I don't think that the party is led by uh, anyone close to the charismatic figure of Deng Xiaoping. I think there are a lot of opportunists waiting in the wings uh, to, to jump on the current regime when it, when it makes a mistake, and, and it will make a mistake. Um, but the, the big question for me, as I alluded to in my remarks, is when that change happens, uh, will a political opportunist take advantage of the mood of the country that is more populist, more, say, Han nationalist, um, more aggressive, a kind of Putin-like Putin figure, or, um, or is there enough inside China today in terms of uh, ideas of, of liberalism and the rule of law and civil society that would, would check against that kind of move. And I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's inc incredibly hard to quantify. Uh, most people study revolutions after they happen, backwards. Uh, I guess it's impossible to study them before they happen. But, but I, I, I think China will change. I think there will be political change in China. It's just a question of will it be for the, for the, for the better or for the worse. Is this working? The only thing I'd add to the remarks that I made is this. I do believe that if you look at the whole of human history, the truth is that the arc of the universe does bend toward justice. But as King and any number of activists would be the first to say, that arc doesn't bend unless people have grabbed hold and are pulling on it, pulling it in the right direction. And that, of course, is exactly what local activists like yourselves, ourselves, need to do and it's also what the U.S. government needs to do. Thanks for letting me ask another question. Yeah, there we go. Thanks for letting me ask another question. <clears throat> uh, my question was, uh, we're looking at you know, I like to study history a little bit. So if we look at what happened in Russia, how it was attempted to demo become a democracy, and I say attempted because we say that democracies don't fight each other. We look at what happened with Georgia last year and so on and so forth. So the question now begs is, if China were to have a re revolution or try to democratize, is it really ready for it and would it become a pseudo-democracy and what could America do to, to prevent that. And I also wanted to add, uh, thank you, Mr. Schultz, for a very, very inspiring speech. So. Um, well, uh, oh, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. I think uh, Putin's invasion of Georgia was uh, Russia is far from a democracy. I mean, it, it, it made some progress towards democracy in the 90s, and, uh, and obviously um, they kind of had a counter a pushback and, and a counter revolution in a sense. And, and so, you know, you, what, annoy, what annoys Putin more than anything else is, is to have these democracies or, or sort of close to democracies on its periphery. That, that may be part of NATO or close to NATO, and, and so that would be a, a prime example, I guess, of the converse of what um, William Schultz was talking about, which is that um, it tends to be autocracies these days that, that um, are more aggressive. In terms of uh, the, the second part of your question, which – How do we prevent – Oh, um, well, again, I, I, you know, I need to drive this point home. It's – it's, it's impossible to know, you know, social change and revolution can happen so quickly. Uh, let's go back to Tiananmen, for example. Uh, Jiao, Jiao Ziyang, it could have gone a different way. I mean, if, if, 
if uh, the party had decided to go along with that faction, Jia Ziyang and, and, and so on, and decided not to declare martial law and decided to enact, um, enact reforms as the students wanted, uh, we could see a very different China today. History is so contingent upon uh, these decisions made, you know, made in crisis. So it, it, it would be very difficult to know today. What we do know, I think, about China is they have an in incredibly dynamic society, technologically and economically and, and socially, that is <coughs> sat upon by this calcified autocracy that may be maybe getting better in terms of its its um, some of its high tech means to to put down unrest, but it's still very calcified. And and so what we and that is a recipe for for unrest of all kinds, as we're seeing in China. I don't think China is a very a very stable place. That's what we do know. We do know there are reformers, but we also know that there are people who who attack the Chinese government for going too far towards towards capitalism. So what we don't know today, and it's too complex to even figure out, um, in some ways, is which which force is stronger. Should something happen in China, and, and should the government government fall? Uh, history is um, very uh, mysterious sometimes. Uh, do you know Mao is uh, from a uh, province of Hunan? But the people who uh, damaged uh, Mao's portrait, they are from Hunan. Uh, if you think uh, the change in Russia is not the idea you expect, but maybe uh, the change in China might be even more uh, ideal uh, as we expected. Uh, you as American, because you've been living in this in this country a long time, you probably don't know the real uh, essence of being a free man here. Uh, I, I did some research about uh, you Americans. I think they are two very fundamental uh, uh, two very fundamental uh, things uh, here. 是你们社会的高度自治从上到下的高度自治你比如说我在罗德岛事件罗德岛是一个国家罗德岛的事情白宫管不了整个社会是高度自治提一下提一下让白宫自治我不知道怎么翻译哈利哈利哈利哈利
and the, the reason why uh, this country is is a free country is because they have these two very basic foundations. Chang China has spent the last 30 years uh, to modernize its society, and uh, it's, it's very slow, uh, but maybe, that's why maybe when China came to the state, the, to, the, to the day that it's become a modernized country, or a, modern, uh, a dem democratic country, it might be even be a, a better state, uh, or more, uh, a better state than Russia. Uh, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, uh, let me take the next question. That gentleman at the back. Thanks. Uh, I'm Sean Tan, and I'm a reporter with the AFP News Agency. Uh, the question might be slightly broad, but I was wondering, um, 20 years after Tiananmen, how much of the um, of uh, the reform of of the reform movement of the uh, the Chinese reform movement? Do you think we could say is actually based overseas, uh, in particular um, by dissidents who have moved to the U.S.? Um, and perhaps that's inevitable to an extent, but could there potentially be risks in that in terms of trying to change uh, policy in China to have so much of the movement coming from overseas? Let me uh, briefly answer that. I think when you talk about reform, there are really uh, two parts of it, at least. Uh, the political reforms and economic reform. In terms of economic reforms, uh, as I mentioned earlier, after uh, 1992, it was a really a wholesale uh, uh, move towards uh, marketization, uh, more thorough than what happened in the 1980s. Of course, there were many problems in the process: of social injustice and uh, you know uh, environmental problems, etc. Uh, but uh, you can say, uh, in terms of uh, 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 economic reform, uh, China really made a great deal of progress over the past uh, uh, two decades. Uh, in, in, in the political uh, arena, though, uh, the, uh, there's a, this a backsliding, uh, so that there's a, a decent, especially within the party, is uh, uh, much less tolerated. Although um, there are still brave souls in China who are willing to voice their uh, different opinion, uh, as uh, uh, we've seen recently with the uh, Charter uh, 08, and also as we've seen uh, with the recent uh, commem commemorative activities inside China of the events of uh, 1989. Uh, I'm the publisher of Me Beijing Spring, but in this issue of Beijing Spring, which you're welcome to take a copy home, uh, there are a couple of uh, pictures of a gathering in Beijing, another part of China, of people commemorating 1989. Uh, uh, we also, you know, get uh, regular contributions from China uh, to our magazine uh, with people using their real names, and we send them, you know, uh, checks, and they they would just take it. Uh, so in that sense, th uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, activities going on in China. The problem is it's not reaching a, a, the level of the party apparatus. This is a very rather different from before uh, 1989. Remember, uh, Zhao Ziyang was a party general secretary. He was in favor of reform. We couldn't identify anything uh, nearly uh, that uh, helpful uh, within the party uh, today. So, so as a result, uh, we are waging a uh, campaign for reform uh, far away from the center of power, but we're, we're, we're just hoping that we'll keep the flame alive someday, uh, it uh, uh, will ignite uh, and uh, bring about uh, fundamental changes uh, in China. I think the most productive thing for those who have been forced to leave home, which is of course a violation of uh, the human rights of those people who have been forced to leave. Um, or those who have uh, gone abroad for other reasons and then want to, like all of us, reach back and support change, positive change in China, they think of themselves as being in a supporting role, and that can be in helping with the technology, helping with uh, fundraising, helping uh, 
compensate for the censorship, surveillance, and restrictions inside the country, but I, positive changes uh, come, cannot come from outside a country. So people who want to help see themselves as a supporting role in strengthening civil society inside China. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Hi, Seth Warren from the CC, CECC. Uh, this question's for David Yu and other panelists if they want to comment. In your description of what occurred at Tiananmen in 1989, you emphasized the underlying emotions of the CCP, CCP and the student protesters. Uh, you said Deng was fearful of the students, Lee was hysterical, and the students were angry. Uh, today, as the panelists have said, the emotions of the party, uh, uh, the, excuse me, the mood of the country the, and the emotions of the party and the majority of students have shifted. Uh, the CCP is still insecure, but more confident and even arrogant, and the students are, uh, seem, are still angry, uh, but sometimes for different reasons. Um, my two questions are, why aren't today's students angry uh, about um, what occurred in 1989 or about uh, democratic issues like uh, political reform and freedom of expression? Have they been duped by propaganda uh, or um, are they, have they been placated by economic reforms? And then is the second question deals with the CCP. Uh, is making the Chinese government more secure uh, instead of insecure a avenue for political reform, or is that just a uh, foolish, uh, foolish assertion given its history? Thanks. I'll, I'll try to answer this very uh, complicated uh, uh, question. Uh, I think um, part of the reason that you don't see as much discontent in China is, of course, uh, the uh, economic opportunities uh, that uh, opened up after 19. Uh, 98, uh, 1989, especially after 1992. And, uh, you know, people had the opportunities to make money. They, they feel that, uh, and they also got the sense that uh, even though uh, a lot of people didn't know the details of, you know, what happened in 1989, they got the sense that the politics is something that you'd better not touch. And that was really a feeling that uh, prevailed in China uh, during the whole of Mao's uh, uh, rule of the, the 27 years, uh, you know, when, when I came to the U.S., I was a physics student. I wanted to study economics, and my dad would say, you know, that's a very bad decision because if if you get involved in social sciences uh, later on, you you know uh, get uh, you know a purge or whatever. So so that that feeling was always there, and I think it's still there today. People don't want to you know touch the sensitive issues. And uh, uh, so in that, in that way, the, the, you can say the CCP was successful in engendering that kind of fear, uh, sometimes the latent fear, sometimes even unconscious fear uh, among the Chinese population. This helped them greatly you know, with their control of the uh, population. Uh, I, I didn't really quite catch the, the second part of the question, so uh, I, if either you, maybe somebody else can um, answer it. Oh, just, uh, so whether or not it's a good strategy to make the Chinese government more secure. Uh, in, in, uh, <laughs> I can attempt to answer. I think I understand the question. Okay. okay. I, it, it, if I understand it correctly, I, yeah, U.S. policy since Nixon o is opening to China has been, um, has been quite straightforward in terms of strengthening the CCP. I mean, in, in, and this has gone on for um, this has gone on for for uh, over 30 years now, and again, the idea was that uh, for real politic reasons, there's always a justification. Back then, it was because of the Soviet Union and checking the Soviet Union and and making the Chinese stronger against the Soviet Union or getting out of Vietnam. Um, I, again, I quoted to you. Uh, I quoted to you the the issue of um, what happened after Tiananmen, how quickly we. We reversed course and uh, and decided that that we were going to quietly continue to support the CCP, and I, I think that this is for a number of reasons. One is um, we always fear the unknown. I think the the CCP has convinced us through through propaganda and other means that that they're better than the alternative, which is which is chaos and um, 
you know, so, so I, I think the policy has always been to, to strengthen the CCP, and, and the Bush administration actually at times spoke op openly of that. Um, now, I, I personally don't think it's a good it's a good policy. I, I think that we still have a lot of leverage in terms of Chinese insecurities about various things, uh, and I'll just use a couple examples. One is, uh, I don't think it's a partic particularly good uh, policy to to make the Chinese feel secure that we will allow them to have their way on Tibet, for example. I, I don't think that's uh, either a, a good moral policy or a good uh, uh, strategic policy. I don't, I, you know, another example would be, I don't think we have to let China into every club in, in the world, um, you know, just to, just to keep giving the Chinese government quote unquote face. I think that there are a lot of Chinese reformers out there who would use the fact uh, that China wasn't allowed into uh, certain clubs where rule of law and democracy mattered would use that fact against their government and and, and say uh, basically turn that on them as as a political strategy and say you know you have to change if China is ever going to be a great a great nation. Lady at the back. Hi, Amy Rieger from the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Um, thanks for your comments. Um, I wanted to ask about your opinion regarding the potential of programs such as uh, legal exchange programs for, um, for lawyers from China to come to the U.S. and other countries that have an independent judiciary and then go back home to China where there's, we all know there's a lack of an independent um, judiciary. Um, what kind of effect do you think these programs uh, have? How much potential for reform? And do you think that um, whatever um, uh, positive effects come from these programs can, can trickle up or spread? And I just wanted to ask also, although it's highly speculative, um, if reform comes about in China, um, what is most likely going to uh, bring about this change? Do you think it's going to come more from grassroots uh, efforts and from civil society? Or do you think it's going to come um, from a change within the party apparatus itself? Or, um, and how much um, do you think it's going to come from encouragement from the outside, such as from US efforts to promote reform? Thanks. Yeah, that's a multi-part question for me. Who would like to go first? I'll, I'll try to answer a little bit of it. Uh, I, I think uh, all the exchange programs uh, between the U.S. And, and the Western world and China in the past uh, 30 years, actually more, uh, Dan mentioned uh, the Kissinger's opening to China, uh, so th th this goes back, go, uh, way further back. I think these exchanges helped a lot, but we can say uh, in a sense, we've uh, been there, done that, uh, with all these exchanges, uh, it didn't really change you know, uh, the political system in China. Uh, so I'm not sure if I, one more program will, will help, to help too much. Uh, the, pro the problem there is that there is this uh, uh, power structure that is uh, really hard to break in. And even you have the, uh, new ideas, uh, you know, you don't really have a chance to practice those ideas anymore. You, you sort of either get uh, uh, sort of uh, subsumed by the system or you just uh, get in yourself into trouble. That's my understanding of, uh, of what's going on. Uh, with, with uh, the exchange of ideas. The Chinese, uh, uh, the CCP leadership knows quite a bit of the outside world and they, you know, they're familiar with a lot of these uh, things. So in this uh, sense, it's not the same as the old Soviet leaders who really didn't know much of the outside world. They hardly ever traveled you know, outside of the Soviet Union, for example. Uh, I don't know, I don't think Stalin ever uh, came to this country <laughs> or, uh, or Mao, you know. Uh, the, um, the other thing is uh, you, you are asking hypothetically what's going to tr uh, trigger reform, should reform come. I, I think the, uh, uh, back in 1989, in fact, uh, uh, the reason there was this uh, massive uh, wave that demonstrations is that uh, 13 years ago, uh, further back in 1976, there was a wave of demonstrations. It was suppressed, but uh, not by army, it was by, you know, uh, uh, military police with, with clubs, basically. Some people were thrown into jail. 
so they learned from th their lesson that uh, maybe this is what they want to expect. It did not. Uh, so um, that's uh, probably why people are so uh, still, like, as I said, latently fearful of uh, what could happen. But I still think in the future that kind of demonstrations may again uh, uh, be triggered by some kind of uh, mistakes or misdeeds uh, by, by the government. And if that happens, that could well, well uh, uh, lead to another round of reforms. Uh, history did not repeat itself the last time around. Let's hope, let's hope that history will not repeat itself the next round. Let's hope the next round is going to be a successful uh, uh, reform program being implemented as a result of, uh, you know, uh, expression of massive uh, discontent. Let me just respond briefly to your second question about how that kind of change takes place by making reference to two examples within our own lifetimes where we have seen that happen, South Africa and Eastern Europe. Obviously there are no exact, uh, these are not mirror images of uh, China and I'm not suggesting that, but we do know that two factors were important in both of those contexts. One was that there was uh, significant discontent within the country itself, uh, that, uh, that there, at least in the case of South Africa, were vibrant opposition movements that were in some cases well organized within the country. But that those alone were not enough that at the same time in both cases there needed to be significant international pressure of one sort or another brought to bear upon the social context in which that discontent and unrest was roiling. And in South Africa, obviously, there were significant economic uh, sanctions that were brought against uh, the South African government. Those are probably not practical within the Chinese context. Uh, in Eastern Europe, there, there was ongoing pressure as part of the so-called Cold War. Uh, but it was indeed a combination of those two things that transformed those political systems. And it's, I think, highly unlikely, unless both of those factors are present, that significant change will take place, barring some cataclysmic event brought on by perhaps economic distress. Um, the the, the lesson for that is that we, from the outside, can have relatively little influence on the internal discontent and the uh, degree of self-organization and effective uh, political action of, of that, but we certainly can have influence on the other factor, uh, the uh, international and external pressure. Um. Okay, we've run out of time, so uh, a, a, quick, a couple of quick logistical uh, issues. Um, for lunch, we have sandwiches out in the lobby. Um, unfortunately, our soundproofing isn't very good, so um, in order for us not, not to disturb um, other people who are working, after you, you get your food, if you can kindly come back in here in about 15 minutes, we're going to clear the room somewhat so you can move around and, and sit. Um, and also, finally, uh, there are a lot of handout materials uh, if you want to take a look. Uh, thank you, everyone.